Today I'm going to talk about the logic of charity and to do so assumes that charity is some sort of coherent entity yet the first thing to note is that a huge variety of things come under this umbrella that we call charity from massive multinational organisations that have got a presence all around the globe like Oxfam or Save the Children to tiny volunteer run organisations like a lunch club for elderly people that's just run on one housing estate on every second Tuesday from the organisations that campaign for access to family planning, for an end to fox hunting and for same-sex marriage, to charities that campaign against all those things. And from the charities that try to raise millions of pounds to do expensive things like find a cure for cancer or buy masterpieces for art galleries, to those that just need a few hundred pounds like to run a, a holiday scheme for a certain group of kids in one town. These are all charities, but they're obviously different in so many ways. So when we ask, why do people give to charity? Well, that really makes about as much sense as asking, why do people shop? Shop for a pint of milk or shop for a yacht with a helicopter landing pad? Is there a logic of shopping that can possibly encompass and explain every transaction that's uh, described using that word? So what I wanted to do with uh, the piece of research I'm going to talk about today, that's all included in this book, which by the way, is co-authored with John Mohan, who's a professor at the University of Birmingham, the goal in this book was to talk about this idea of what charity is, how it operates, who it benefits, and what can and should we expect it to do. And it was born of our sense that the word and the concept was rife with misunderstanding and misconceptions. So let me explain why we thought that. Have you ever seen someone shake a tin and say, it's for charity, without any further explanation of which charity? Or when a person in the public eye who's been caught doing something wrong they promise to make a donation to charity, again, without saying which charity or what for. So people use that word charity as if it's self-explanatory and just have a sing has a single meaning. And politicians do it too. Politicians of often praise charity en masse and suggest that it's got homogenous qualities like being able and available to step in when public funding is cut. When David Cameron became prime minister back in 2010, he set out an agenda called the Big Society in which charities in general were viewed as natural partners. He said, our charities undertake vital work, bringing communities together and providing support to some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Well, whilst many charities do do exactly that sort of thing, many don't, either because that's not what they were set up to do or because it's not what their donors fund them to do. And earlier this year, the House of Lords debated a select committee report with the hurrah title, Stronger Charities for a Stronger Society. And that report begins with these words. Charities are the eyes, ears and conscience of society. They mobilise, they provide, they inspire, they advocate and they unite. All of them? Does Eton unite us? Is Canterbury Rugby Club the conscience of society? How useful is it to make such sweeping statements? And this homogenous approach to charity extends to blame as well as to praise. Charity fundraising in particular has come under a great deal of scrutiny in the last few years as a result of tabloid headlines like these about how some charities have used some fundraising techniques like direct mail and telephone fundraising. The consequences of this uh, kerfuffle has included an overhaul of the self-regulation system, fines imposed by the Information Commissioner's Office on 13 charities, and an investigation by the Public Administration and Const Constitutional Affairs Committee, whose report was published with declarations that the reputation of the entire sector had been damaged by this sorry episode. And Rob Wilson, then Minister for Civil Society, said that the charity sector had one last chance to get its house in order. The entire sector, that is. Not just those named and shamed in tabloid headlines, or just those 13 who were fined, but all 100,000 or so fundraising charities in England and Wales are apparently all in the last chance saloon, culpable in common for each other's actions. Now this doesn't happen in other sectors. When Lehman Brothers went bust in 2008 at the start of the great uh, last recession, my local news agent wasn't implicated, but that's also in the for-profit sector. A corner shop and a massive bank, they're clearly different enough to be treated differently. But if you've got your local kids scout pack and Oxfam, well, they're both charities, so they're just two peas in a pod, right? And this kind of misunderstanding is not restricted to blanket views about the value or crimes of charities. It takes other forms too. Many people underestimate just how many charities there are. If you say to them, how many charities are they? They start 
counting them off on their fingers, they'll say, well, you've got the lifeboats, you've got Bernardo's, you've got the British Heart Foundation. In fact, there's over 150,000 registered charities in England and Wales. That would take quite a lot of fingers to, to count them. Another misunderstanding is about overheads and core costs. Some people really feel that these are quite an abomination. People shouldn't be paid to work in charities. They don't see it as the price of a well-run organisation. And despite charities in England and Wales spending up to £70 billion a year, there's minimal understanding of where that money comes from or where it goes. So these are all the different reasons why we thought there was a problem uh, worth researching. And we didn't do it by half. Uh, that book, The uh, Logic of Charity, has got over a dozen research projects in it. And in the rest of this talk, I'm going to share with you uh, the findings from some of them. So first of all, I'll talk about public attitudes to charity and how that has and hasn't changed over time. Then I'll share data that I've collected in studies that are focused on different kinds of donors, as listed here. And I'll also talk about research that I've done with those involved in mediating charitable acts, notably fundraisers. And I'll draw together the headline points from all these studies to highlight what they tell us about the logic of charity, such as there is one, and make a comparison with the logic of government's uh, decision making and action in that realm. And I'll conclude that this reveals a picture of charitable activity that's rather at odds with widespread assumptions that are held by the public and perhaps more worryingly by politicians. So let's turn first to the public attitudes data. We know from the annual UK giving survey, which is run by the Charities Aid Foundation, and from government data on giving, that most of us do give at least once a year, and almost half of us give every month. But is this widespread support reflected in people's attitudes and opinions? This table contains the results of asking the same set of questions in 1991 and again in 2015, originally in a British social attitude survey. And then we commissioned an update uh, in the last few years using the exact same wording for comparison purposes. In 1991, respondents could uh, choose a no answer option. So sometimes the rows don't always add up to exactly 100. The most significant shift we found is in response to the first statement. The proportion agreeing that people should look after themselves and not rely on charities nearly doubled from 28% in 1991 to 52% in 2015. This is consistent with wider changes over the same period in the direction of greater self-reliance and individualisation in society. This shift in attitudes also appears in the fifth statement that governments should do less for the needy and encourage charities to do more instead. Over three quarters, 77% disagreed with that statement in 1991, but by 2015, that had dropped to just under two thirds. Growing belief in the role of charity is also apparent in the response to the second statement. The proposition that it is not everyone's responsibility to give what they can to charities, three fifths, 60% agreed with that in 1991, but by 2015, this figure was down to 48%, suggesting a growing acceptance of the importance and need for charitable donations. It's also interesting to see increases in agreement that there are too many charities and that most charities are wasteful in their use of funds. The tabloid headlines are clearly having an impact. We also repeated questions from the 1991 British Social Attitudes Survey about who should fund specific areas. In both 1991 and 2015, people felt government responsibility was highest in regards to paying for health, which is represented by kidney machines. Remember, we didn't come up with the wording for these surveys and in housing for homeless people. But in both cases, the proportions holding the view that health and homelessness are the role of government, not charity, fell by almost 20% from 1991 to 2015. However, the shift was not so much to charity bearing solely that burden, but rather to a model of shared responsibility. The response to the lifeboats question is quite revealing about public knowledge of what charity does. In both 1991 and 2015, the majority felt that lifeboats should be entirely or mainly the responsibility of government. Yet the RNLI doesn't accept government funding. Its income, its income is solely from donations, legacies and trading. Shared responsibility for funding the protection of rare animals is the most popular option. But when it comes to holidays for disabled people and food aid to poor countries, most people think that's the responsibility of charity. And that last finding is consistent with what we saw on the previous slide in the final statement, where most people believe that charity should benefit people in Britain rather than overseas. Yet despite this charity begins at home view, there's no indication in this data that people think charity ought to or can rise up to replace government. Most of the shifts are towards a model of shared responsibility, which should give pause for thought to those who believe or hope that charities and their donors can and will step in as the state withdraws.
As for example, that view was held by Jeremy Hunt, who suggested when he was culture secretary, uh, according to this Telegraph article, that wealthy individuals should help plug gaps in funding for arts organisations, he said, as he announced budgets will be cut as a result of cuts in public spending. So there's no ambiguity there about the links between government cuts and government encouraging philanthropy. This is charity as substitute, not as complementary or parallel bars or extension ladders, those other ways it's been conceived over the years. So let's move on now to talk about some other research. I've been studying donors for a decade and have published studies of how donors choose causes, uh, 10 editions of the annual Million Pound Donor Report, a book on why rich people give and some studies of giving circles. And in the past few years, I've been focused on studying fundraisers, which resulted in my book uh, called The New Fundraisers. I could talk about this data all day, but I'm just going to jump to some punchlines. What this body of work shows is that donors' giving decisions are primarily supply-driven, not demand-driven. It's a process based on donors' personal tastes and preferences, rather than being needs-based. People support what they know and care about, and they know and care about it because a charity's work has affected their lives in some way, for better or for worse. So that's why, for example, Cancer Research UK is year on year the top fundraising charity in this country, because everyone knows someone who's been affected by cancer. One of my favourite examples of this supply-driven, personal preference-based phenomenon is a gentleman I interviewed for the How Donors Choose Charities study. He was in his 80s, uh, and the root of his support for butterfly conservation charities went right back to his childhood, seven decades before. He explained that, and this is his words, as a boy, I collected butterflies, so I'm trying to give back, if you like, the damage that I did, because in those days you were encouraged to kill butterflies and collect them, so that's an important one. And when he says it's important, he doesn't mean it's more important than other charitable causes in some sort of objective sense. Rather, he means that in the context of his life and his experiences, it makes sense for him to support that particular cause. This same highly personal approach is described by donors at the other end of the giving scale. Many of the million pound donors that I've interviewed over the years have described their personal connections to the causes that they support. So for example, one of the million pound donors I interviewed had given a million pounds to Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital because her grandson had a rare condition and he was being treated there. And in her words, as she explained, perhaps if I'd had a family member with a different health problem like autism, then I would be supporting a charity that helps autistic children rather than Great Ormond Street. But she said, this is a situation I find myself in. Sometimes donors' decisions relate to a specific geographical area rather than to a particular cause. As with a wealthy woman I interviewed who explained that her family foundation only supports projects in Yorkshire. She said, we all just decided it would be a lot tidier and a lot more personal to us if we restricted it to the county where we lived and worked. And the geographic connection between donors and beneficiaries is also clearly a prime driver behind support for community foundations and other types of place-based giving. So to use a phrase coined by Rob Payton and Michael Moody, everyone has a philanthropic autobiography that leads them to identify more with some causes than with others. The neediness of beneficiaries and the vagaries of public funding that goes up and down are at best secondary issues. Another headline finding from this body of research is that donor autonomy is a key principle. The freedom to choose what you want to support is what makes giving different and more pleasurable to paying tax. This principle of donor autonomy and protection of donor interest is the key principle enshrined in charity law, and it has been since the very first Charity Act of 1601. So despite government's desire to encourage more philanthropy, and that goal has been held by governments of all colours, in reality, politicians have got rather minimal influence in directing donations, and many donors think the government should back right off from their philanthropy, it's a private matter. Indeed, donors might be supporting charities that are challenging government and trying to change the law, and have not stuck to their knitting as they were once told to do by a government minister. Or they might want to support things that are really quite apolitical um, and that cater to lifestyle interests, be it bell ringing, beekeeping or boating, none of which are obviously aligned with any particular political agenda. It's also important to note that philanthropic decisions might be private, but they also involve intermediaries whose agenda is aligned to their particular cause rather than general promotion of the public good. These intermediaries include staff such as fundraisers, whose work involves in identifying potential supporters, asking for a gift, 
and providing donor care to ensure that they, the donors have an enjoyable experience. Every million pound donor that I've interviewed has talked about the joy of giving, how it brings them satisfaction, uh, how it's brought them new relationships and access to people and experiences that, that they wouldn't otherwise have had. Like a man who funds medical research and is allowed to go into the labs to talk to the scientists and see them at work. Or those who fund a rare it item for a museum and then are then allowed to hold it. Or arts donors being invited backstage to watch the curtain call and to meet the stars. It's usually the fundraisers who think up and choreograph these money can't buy experiences to ensure that their donors' lives are enri enriched as a result of their support. Intermediaries can also be volunteers such as trustees who might be friends and colleague colleagues of the potential donor and able to leverage their personal relationships to encourage a gift. Having done so, the norms of reciprocity then kick in. So having asked a friend to give, they know that they have to stand ready to give when they are asked in turn. In this way, major donors can be a bit like a really posh version of buying a round of drinks. I'll support the ballet this year because you're asking me, but next year when I'm running the campaign for the orchestra, you will have to support my cause. The end result of this, as Franz Francie Ostrau pointed out in the US context, is that philanthropy is often about recycling money within groups, and in particular within elite groups, rather than philanthropic resources being moved from the rich to the poor, as many assume is the norm. So to sum up that body of research, the institutional logic of philanthropy, which is a major funding source of charity, is best characterised as supply driven and influenced by these three factors. Firstly, the donor's identification with the cause as a result of their lifetime experiences. Secondly, the donor's confidence in the charitable organisation, which might come from reading financial accounts and impact reports, but more likely comes from personal experience of it as a well-run organisation. And thirdly, donors' desire for personal enrichment, which is often facilitated by intermediaries like fundraisers. For these reasons, I argue that the logic of charity makes it unlikely that charitable efforts will match resources with needs at either an individual or a community level, and, and that it therefore will fall short of public and political expectations. So to conclude, this table describes the fundamental differences between the logic of government on the one hand and the log logic of charity on the other. Government's systemic provision to meet diverse human needs contrasts with charity's idiosyncratic provision of goods and services as, determin as determined by uncoordinated donor efforts. The political system is teleological, which means seeking the best way to organise affairs, whereas charity is non-teleological, accepting that there are many different visions of the public good that can be pursued and achieved. It's obligatory to fund government services through compulsory taxation, whereas charity is funded by voluntary discretionary donations. Government is usually focused on meeting basic needs, whereas charity is focused on both needs and on human flourishing. Government faces categorical constraints, which mean that political action is expected to benefit all citizens equally, whereas philanthropic particularism refers to the fact that donors are free to help whichever subsection of the public they choose, and those they relate to tend to be the ones they do choose. Government spending power is constrained by what median voters, voters will countenance, whereas charities are constrained by philanthropic insufficiency, which refers to the fact that individuals and communities often lack the capacity or the inclination to sustain services indefinitely through private funding. And finally, there's a unified approach within any given period of government to deliver a coherent programme of policies, as set out usually in a political manifesto, but there's no such coherence in the charity sector because different charities and their donors are free to pursue different visions of the public good. So politicians and policymakers are embedded in the way of doing things that are set out on the left-hand side of this table. They understand the organising principles and practices of government. And if they assume that that's how charities work too, it's no wonder that problems occur when they encounter voluntary action and they, they try to harness the logic of charity, which is so very different, in support of their own political programmes. So despite charity being a consistent feature of life in the UK, enjoying broad support from both the public and politicians, we do lack a clear understanding of what charity actually is, how it operates, who it benefits, and what it can and cannot be expected to do. I haven't yet mentioned the subtitle of the book, so let me do that now. It's called The Logic of Charity, Great Expectations in Hard Times. And we chose that subtitle because questions about what charity can and can't do are of enduring significance, but the need to ask them is sharpened in times like now, in the context of deep public spending cuts due to austerity.
there are great expectations that voluntary efforts will arise and expand to plug gaps vacated by the state. The evidence and anal analysis I've just presented here raise questions about whether those expectations are realistic and whether given its supply-driven nature, it's reasonable to expect charity to respond to the most urgent needs and the most disadvantaged communities. Politicians clearly hope so, but the logic of charity, such as it is, suggests not. Thank you for listening.